Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be here and uh, to have some nice cases and discussions. Especially it's um, an honor to be invited by Professor Mervit, uh, who I know is the EP mother of the electrophysiology and even in our country in Germany, in Leipzig, this is called the EP mother, <laughs> mom. So thank you very much for that. And when I was, when I got the first, I'm fine, okay? So uh, uh, when we got the invitation and the program on the topic we should talk about, and uh, then I went through what I would uh, talk about here because you're a very experienced centers and I see a lot of uh, colleagues in electrophysiology and also re uh, remade names so I thought let's tell you something about where the electrophysiology started when I w started as a fellow and did my uh, cases and where we stand at the moment okay so I know we can do some cases conventional and everything we will talk about that but let's look where we are at the moment and for all those who don't know where Germany is or how Germany looks like, this is the, the landmark of Germany. And this is Berlin, where Dr. Blaschka and I live and work in the university since many years. And my first passage message is um, the ablation field, it's a dynamic field. Okay, So it's uh, showing a rising numbers. And if we look at the numbers of Germany, for example, for 2018, we had uh, almost around 95,000, around 100,000 of cadaver ablation cases, with an uh, increase of around 10% when we, when we see how many cases we had in 2017. And almost two thirds of the ablations are AFib ablations. The number is 95,000? Cadaver ablations. In one year? Yes, in, in 2018. So this is the number of 2018. Yes? Ah, uh, uh, since you started? No. It's only One for the year 9,000 each. It's not, it's not our number, it's okay. the number of the whole Germany. Germany. Oh, okay. Germany. Okay. Germany. Okay. Yes. And you see here, we have 305 centers in Germany who perform AFib ablations. So it's a, num a very high number. But interestingly, if you look, it's only 10% of the, of the centers who do most cases. Around 50% of effect ablations are done by only 10 centers. And this is what you see here. The vast majority of the centers you see here is on the right side. It's around 60% of the centers that do the less number of effect ablations or ablations. And this is one of important points when we talk about innovations, when we talk about understand the substrate and how we should go on with the ablation, it's important that we have centers like over here, when we belong here around this, this place, because we in our center, we do around 1,000 cases in a, in a year of ablations. Mostly it's a left chamber ablations, it's either the left ventricle or it's a, a left atrium a tachycardia or a fib which we, we perform. And it's very important to, to, to have these centers so we can talk about innovations, yes. And when I started, who does who knows this these pictures? Have you ever seen these this system? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I started like years ago, this was our yes. This this is the localizer, and this was our localiza. yeah the localizer. Uh, or yes. I never saw it. I heard about the name. Yeah. Localiza. But localiza was the first. 3D system, you know, it doesn't show it here, but it's written here, it's a 3D system. We, was we it Medtronic? Yes, it was Medtronic. And yeah. it did not uh, it, it, No, or, no, oh, so oh, the, the, the only thing was, it was actually a 2D system, but by splitting your view as an RAO and a LAO, which you could see at the same time, it was a 3D system. So we call it always a 3D system for those who can not afford a 3D system at that moment, but it was not because of affording, it was because the technique wasn't so, so far. And later on, we had the Carter system. You know that? I know yeah. most of you use the Carter system, but this is when I started doing atrial ablations. We took point, point by point, all the atrium tissue, and then we had these kind of pulmonary veins. Well, this has been developed very much, and then we do the pulmonary vein isolation, and it worked. It took around three to four hours, but it did work. And we had only this catheter. We had only one catheter at the tip, a bipolar catheter, but taking pipe work pond and then doing the ablation. But now, what do we have? 
we have come a long way. We have a, l a lot of different development. We have, in the cadeter field, we have cadeters with mini electrodes. This is one cadeter from the Boston Scientific. You have the normal distal uh, tip, but you have on all the sides mini electrodes. I will talk about that. We have now cadeters with measuring the contact, the contact force, which gives you a, a better feeling of what is your contact and to avoid perforation, but to have also better lesions. But we have also a lot of different catheters in the field of doing the mapping. Yes, we have here the regular catheter, which is the lasso catheter, the circular catheter, which you know, which is actually used in all the AFib cases. But we're coming more and more to these parts. This is a pentary catheter from the, ca from the bias of Webster. Uh, you know that. This is a catheter from the Boston Scientific, the Orion catheter. And this is a newly uh, produced catheter, the HD grid catheter from the Abbott system. I will talk about this. But then you can ask, why do we need this? I know you do a lot of conventional ablation over here, and it works, and you have good results. But why do we need that? It's a very good question. And if I show you this picture, what would you say, what is this? This is the ocean. This is the ocean. This is the ocean. Any other suggestions? Not the matter of blood. Not a no. Well, I'm showing all this. Not a matter of blood, but an ocean. So when I go to the next part, what do you think? What is now? Okay. It's the ocean. It's the ocean. So my, but we would say, okay, it's the ocean. Here's land, but but what is over here? I mean, why? What do you have? But if we go like this, oh. yes, storm. All right, hur hurricane. But this is this is what I want to say. You need tools to understand what we do. And we know the cornerstone of ablation and atrial fibrillation is the PVI. We have seen the star F studies and all other studies. But you need tools to understand what we are because our success rate, it doesn't matter where you go, in which country, over the, over the world, we're not above 75% or 80%. It doesn't matter which kind of AFib you are ablating. So we need these tools to understand it. So the first tool I would like to present to you is the Orion mini basket catheter. It's a catheter which is which has four splines here, uh, eight splines, sorry, and all on eight, eight of these splines, there are low impedance mini electrodes attached on it. This is different than the catheters we know. The, the other catheters, the, there are electrodes, but these electrodes are attached on it. So we have less noise. It's a, it's a catheter which you can undeploy or deploy and work with it. The mini electrodes have only a diameter of 0 0.4 millimeter. And the good thing is that you can work with this with a, it's a magnet, a magnet sen sensor or uh, with the EP impedance. Because of the low impedance, it's not so prone to, to the shifts. So it's more a catheter which works with magnetic system. Which system? It's the Boston Scientific. Boston Scientific. It is the Boston Scientific. It's the Rhythmia system. The, 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 the system you're working is the Rhythmia system. And this is an example of, the, of this ablation catheter, which has also mini electrodes, which I showed it to you. It's the same, the, the, the mini basket and the, 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 the MIFA catheter, they have the same uh, characterization. And you see over here, this is the tip of the catheter. This is an atrial fibrillation ablation case. You see here the, the sickness on the tip of the catheter, and these are the sickness on the mini electrodes. And this is done during ablation. And what you see here, you see the signals disappearing on the mini electrodes, but you still have it on the tip of the catheter. So if you ablate with a normal ablation catheter, you would still see the signals, but actually you have already got a lesion at that point. So these mini electrodes helps you find if you're doing a good job or not, or, or if your signals are disappearing or not. And this can help you avoid perforation, for example. And so you stop the ablation at the moment when you, ha when you see the sickness are disappearing. This is one benefit of the mini electrodes. The second one, this is a patient who had already had a prior, prior, uh, prior PVI and a cafe ablation. This is a patient of the STAR AF study uh, of our own patient who we then came back years ago, years later with atrial fibrillation. And you see here a 3D map with this catheter all the pink places is the healthy ones, and all the red and, and gray zones are the, 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 the zones of the fibrotic. And what you see that you can do nice maps, seeing where's the gap. And you see here the line, here's no gap, 
But here at this spot or here, you see nice gaps, which you they can go and apply it at that point. You see here at the, at the beginning the signal, which is only seen on the MiFi, on the mini electrodes, and by ablating over this, that spot, the, you, you close the gap. This helps you avoid uh, long procedures, perforations, and, and an ablation which the patient doesn't need. So you can just go there and do the, 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 the gap closure. There was, there was a study, a very nice study, comparing the pulmonary vein signals on a lasso catheter, on, on this Orion catheter, which the basket catheter, which I showed you. This is the same patient in the same lab at the same time. What the colleague did, they put a Orion catheter in the pulmonary vein, and they put a lasso catheter in the pulmonary vein. And what after ablation, and what they saw is that you still see the signals of the PV in on the Orion catheter, and you don't see it anymore on the lasso. So they came up that you have around 20% of overestimating the PVI. So if you apply it with only with the lasso catheter, only if you go for the signals. Of course, we have different methods to compare them. We have the exit block, we have the entry block, we can do that. But just comparing the catheters and see how sensitive it is, the mini electrodes are more sensitive. But we know cornerstone is the PVI. Of course, it helps in, in, in many cases, but we still have patients who come again and again, even the p when the uh, pulmonary veins are isolated, they still have a fib. And here's a nice study published that we see what is the substrate. So this is what we are, we are coming right now at the point we are talking about the substrate. We're not talking about the substrate uh, in ventricle tachycardia, but we're also talking about substrate in atrial fibrillation. And when you look here, mostly the vast majority of patients with a fib, proximal fib, they have a healthy tissue. But we have like around 50, 50 or 60 percent of patients with persistent atrial fibrillation or chronic atrial fibrillation who show you a lot of spaces of fibrotic tissue. And these patients, we cannot ablate them just by doing the pulmonary vein isolation. We have to go further steps. And we need, for these patients, we need the tools. And what we're thinking of, what should we do? We know the star F studies. We know the lines, we know the cafes, we compared everything, but it's still, we didn't show it the lines or the cafe ablation is not better if we just do the PVI. So we come up now, the electrophysiologists are coming up now with the idea to localize the substrate, see where the substrate comes from, and then ablate the substrate. A nice study from Leipzig, um, and they could show that if you do an individualized ablation of, this, of the spots where you see the fibrotic tissue, by ablating at that, at, at that point, you have a, a higher success rate to get the patients um, arrhythmia-free. And for this, I would like to introduce you the catheter, the HD catheter. For that, I have to explain first what we have right now. We have the unipolar mapping and we have the bipolar mapping. But the unipolar mapping, you have a stable morphology, but you have far field potentials. And you don't know where the direction is coming from. But the bipolar mapping, you have better signals, you have less far fields, but it's still, you cannot say where the direction is coming from. For example, here, you see these are the unipolar signals. And if you come from the different direction on, on the electrode, you see that if, only if you're at the angle of zero, where the both electrodes are, you see a nice signals. Otherwise, you have a signal which is smaller. And now we're coming and thinking, OK, might, we might answer these, or we might cover this lack of information by doing an omnipolar mapping. What is an omnipolar mapping? This is the catheter for that. It's a, a four-spline closed frame catheter, which, is, which gives you nice um, signals and you can combine the different electrodes, they're, they're at a three millimeter distance uh, on, on, on in each spline, so uh, you avoid uh, far fields actually. And this is the explanation. If you put a bipolar catheter in the way where the wavefront is coming from, so we are electrophysiologists, we have to work with what is happening over there. You see the signal coming up here. But if you change your bipolar catheter, uh, parallel to where the wavefront is coming, so you don't see exactly the, 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 the signal. So you, 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 you might think you have a fibrotic tissue over there, you already have, so you have low voltage there, but it actually has to do with, the, with where the wavefront is coming. But if you work with this catheter, it doesn't matter because of the combination 
of, it doesn't matter if you take the B1, C1, or B1, B2, it doesn't matter how your catheter is on the tissue and where the wavefront is coming, because of this combination, you're much better able to, to get the signals and see, see where it comes from. What they do is they, they do a du best duplicate algorithm. That means if you have a B1, C1, and you see there's a low uh, amplitude signals, and then you, co you compare it with the B1 or B2 combination, for example, you see this, this signal is much higher. And then this signal is, is taken for validation or taken for the voltage map uh, evaluation. Here's an example of our lab where we, you see the number of the points which we have taken are e equal. But this map is the standard mapping, so with the bipolar, if you combine the bipolar, and this map is, is with HD wave, this, this, this combination, which I right now show you, and you see there here is the healthy tissue. And here you would, you, you would think it is not a, a, a healthy tissue, and you might then start, this was a patient who had already had a PVI, you might start ablating here or doing a roof line, which would not be necessary in these patients. So these catheters help us understand the substrate and do uh, what only, only the ablation which is needed for the patient. I would like to show to you uh, this catheter in a patient where we did a ventricle tachycardia ablation, a patient who had a reduced left ventricle ejection fraction of 30% in March 2018. Coronary artery disease was excluded, um, but the patient had again and again ventricle tachycardia. A biopsy was done and did uh, could uh, confirm the diagnosis of myocarditis. The patient was treated with um, immunosuppression and a cardio MRI in November 2018 showed an improvement of the, of the uh, left uh, ejection fra fraction, but it's still a persistent myocarditis. So the patient got an ICD. And later on, in, in, in February this year, the patient had recurrent VTs. And these recurrent VTs were ablated in Hamburg uh, endocardial but an MRI a month later showed a scar posterior lateral, but an epicardial uh, scar posterior lateral. We got the patient in our lab, um, or in our, in our hospital, because of electrical stomp, patient had again and again um, a ventricle tachycardia, which had to be treated by ATP or by the shots. So we decided to see what we can find and how we can do the ablation. This is the baseline ECG of the patient uh, when we started uh, the, the, the electrophysiology study, and whenever we put, we have a patient with uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia or atrial tachycardia, which is not a fib, but atrial tachycardia, we do a EP study, and you see here we have induced uh, ventricular tachycardia. But the main point is so, from the fellows, who can tell me where it comes from? Yeah. Where do we look for? Now everyone is awake. So first of all, very good. The morphology is changing, but we can, we we just don't look where is the morphology. It's a great, it's, yes, absolutely. Because this is why I'm I'm showing the different cycle length. Yes. What would you say? What would you say where the VT is coming from? To see V1. Yes. This is positive. The V1? Negative. negative. And then positive. Yeah. What you see is the... It started negative and then become positive. Very good. So we have two different VTs, yes. as already said. The VTs is changing, absolutely. But when you look at the first VT, we have a negative core condense. And the inferior lead, it is negative. It's... The end, yes. IVF and the yes. V3 lead yes. to negative. So yes. this is from the inferior part. The inferior part, absolutely. And then it is the next uh, VT is from the superior part, as it is positive. But so it's coming it from the apex. Yes, from the apex and yes. from the uh, and from the base. From Very the good. base, it is mostly uh, mitral annulus. But is it, it is coming? But is this one coming from the base? Because you have an EVR uh, positive. This is the no man's land. We don't. We, don't, we have no papillary muscle there. We have no mitral valve. Nothing. So, but you're absolutely right. It is from the inferior. It's going to be from the apical. 
What we did is we tried to, thank you very much for that. Thank you. So what, what we do, did is we tried to uh, overstimulate it because it was instable and we induced the in a, a, a fibrillation, we, we did the, the shock. But this is not, we don't leave it like that. So we have to still find where is DVT coming and we have to spot it. So we do again a uh, AP study at the same time. And then we have this tachycardia. Now when you look, so the most important thing is to look at the, at the, at the uh, precardial leads, where it's coming from. Yeah? The first precardial leads, which we shot, the, the first VT, it, it's very all negative, and this one is all positive, yes? So it's coming something around, it's a postural part. It's coming from the backwards, and then it's the, the wave front is going from back to the, to the front. So what we decided is that we said, okay, we have three different VTs here. They're not stable. The patient has a postural lateral uh, fibrotic tissue. What would you suggest before I tell you what we did? Would you go in the ventricle and do the ablation, or would you say, no, it's not ablatable? Very good. But the, but the colleagues had already, because this is a case of, you see here. It was it's done it's, it's, it's before. It was so you have to go into cardiac. Absolutely. This is what we did. We, because we had hints. We had a ablation before in the endocardium. We had an MRI showing an epicardial uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, fibrotic tissue. So what I did is we went epicardial. And for the epicardial puncture, we search for the sternum and then the satisfied uh, the angle and under the satisfied angle we I, I always puncture by putting a, a little bit of, of contrast and and then uh, looking my way with the x-ray you see here it's a 90 degrees LAO projection uh, I also use the EP1 just to also know which direction I'm moving so I d most of the time it's l uh, to the left mammalia where you where I'm pointing there what's the EP1 if you need it EP1, EP1. So you ha you see it, or you're too lateral, or you're too medial. You can use that. Um, from from the up from from EP view, EP view, EP view. Yes. So and you see here, but the third attempt where I'm coming here in the epicardium, and this is the first time I look for when I do an epicardial ablation. The second thing is I put a wire in the epicardium and when it goes around the ventricle you're absolutely 100 percent sure you're there so you see over here our uh, the ep cat uh, catheter which we have put in in the epicardium and then we started doing a voltage map of the epicardium with this new catheter this yes. is sanjut system this is sanjut this system is precision. this is the precision mm -hmm. yes this is the precision system we have it in one hospital here And what we saw, it's not only important to, to do a, a voltage map of these patients to see the substrate, because we're not looking only for the substrate, we're looking also for, for lavas, as you already said, this local abnormal, uh, uh, ventricle abnormality activities. And with this catheter, you have the, the advantage because where it's coming from, because of the bipolar connection, which you can do, um, what you see here, these are the late diastolic potentials during the sinus rhythm showing here a very nice spot. This is the, the color which you see, it's which is what, what, what is the latest activation on the catheter, and this has been shown here with the white color. And of course, here an example of, with the HD catheter of the late potential, which you really nicely see here, these are the lavas which we we'll look for. And once we find this, we're happy because we know where we, we go for it. But interestingly, this is, the signals on, on my ablation catheter, it was a tactic uh, sensor catheter, and what you see here, I'm at the same spot, but I don't see these late potentials. Yeah, which shows you, again, the difference between the bipolar mapping and the omnipolar mapping. So these catheters do help What's you. the size of the electrode which uh, coils? Well, yes, but this is four millimeter and this is No, no, seven. this is another catheter. The, 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 the HD catheter uh, is not uh, as small as the mini electrodes of the, of the basket catheter. Oh, okay. Yes, but it still it has more to do where the wave from comes and uh, how, how you can get the signals. Of course, we also do always an uh, endocardial map. It, it belongs to that. We want to see do we have also something inside the, 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 the cavum. 
and this is routinely done all the time. It's not a, uh, uh, that we only just do epicardial uh, mapping, we do also the ventricle this is the mapping. The, the, the gray shadow. The gray shadow is the, the epicardium. epicardium. It's the epicardium. The location. It's the location, yes. Yes, uh, just to show that we are not we not only did the epicardial mapping but also did the endocardial mapping. Once we uh, characterize where the spot is where we want to ablate, uh, we saw that it is in the epicardium, but we still wanted to see what how what is happening in the endocardium. And before we do the ablation, of course, we have to see where the coronary um, uh, arteries are, so we do don't do any damage. If you ablate on the epicardium, you might damage the the, the coronaries. And you see here was the spot where we did the ablation, and there's no coronary which might suffer from the ablation. You, you use the agility short agility sheet? Yes, it's, there's, there's a small agility sheet. It's called the uh, epicardial VT sheet. It's much smaller than the normal agility sheet which you use for uh, VT or you use it for AFib ablations. So this was the spot. You see also here the, the, the voltage map, and you see these and these spots where we see a little bit of, 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 of myocardium, which is still a little bit healthy there, or where the lavas we actually uh, uh, await to see there, and uh, is ablating at that point, we had uh, at the end no VTs anymore inducible, and it's now around six months, the patient still is in sinus rhythm. We didn't have any case of, of ventricular tachycardia. We only had because we see the patients every three months and in their, they're in our home monitoring or in the telemedicine, so we just see some NSVTs but not ventricle tachycardias anymore. At the end, I just want to talk about one more system because where are we going now? Um, we can do the ablation, we see the substrates, and, but we have not always the the typical tachycardia as like, like atrial tachycardia which is stable or a ventricle, ventricle tachycardia which is stable. We, we do also have patients with AF, we have patients with unstable tachycardia and they are very difficult to ablate. Here's a system which we're using newly is the Acutis map system, um, uh, it's an AcuMap system. It's a non-contact mapping catheter. You have 48 ultrasound transducers with these ultrasound transducers you can do uh, you can acquire the anatomy as over here you have to just move your catheter a little bit and by taking the pulse which goes to the tissue and comes back the ultrasound can can bring up an anatomy and secondly between these uh, uh, ultrasound transducers we have 48 um, impedance electrodes which work with the charge density mapping, it's based on charge density, it's, it's based on the ionization of positive and negative um, ions, and this way they can show you where the activation or the voltage is coming from. So we can map stable and unstable rhythms with this. For this, I just wanna show two examples from our lab. We had a 60 years old male patient, had already three-time ablation, PVI, lines ablations in the left atrium, a, a isthmus ablation on the right atrium, and the patient came again and again with persistent atrial fibrillation, which was not co-developable. So what we checked, we saw all veins are still isolated, and then we did a map during AF. I'm not talking about the rotors. Rotors have different, totally different technique, but I'm talking about density mapping uh, charge density mapping these patients and uh, this was the patient uh, with, with the third um, uh, procedure during AF what we saw is that there are a focal discharge during AFib so the, the system is able to show you what is happening during a unstable arrhythmia and what kind of different uh, uh, types of, of arrhythmia you see we saw a focal discharge at this point so near the, the, the inferior pulmonary vein we had here a, a place where the tachycardia did a rotation around, uh, at about 270 uh, um, degree, and we had some irregular <coughs> activation at these spots. So maybe this is where we had the lines because the patient had already had a roof line and an anterior mitral line. What we did, we ablated at this spot and at these spots, and the, for the first time after a long time, the patient was able to be cardioverted in sinus rhythm. After the cardioversion, we did another map because the patient had ectopic beats, two different ectopic beats. The first one coming also from this spot, 
where we did the ablation. And the second ectopic leak came a little bit higher than this. By ablating this, patient stayed first in the sinus rhythm, the ectopic beat disappeared. But this is not enough, because we want to see, does the patient still get any fibrillation? Is it, is it where are the non-PV triggers? And we induced atrial fibrillation again in this patient. In this time, in the left atrium, we could not find any target. So all the targets which we saw before and ablated, we could not see it again. We decided to map the right atrium. So we went to the right atrium, this is the right atrium, this is the tricuspid uh, valve, and this is the symptom. And what we saw here, a nice re tachycardia around the symptom near the CS, and by ablating at this spot, we could terminate the tachycardia and the patient remained in sinus rhythm. Why am I showing this to you? It's not always just pulmonary vein isolation, just doing some lines, and it's more than that. We have to understand the patient. We have to go look for more um, of the substrate and do the ablation. And sometimes it's not only one spot. It's not a cafe ablation. I'm not a fan of the cafe ablation. But it's, we are looking for where can we find the substrate which is responsible for the arrhythmia. And my last uh, 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 slide is uh, atrial tachycardia, a macro re tachycardia of a patient who had already a roof line and a mitral um, annulus line. And you see we compared the EGD grid catheter, which I showed you to you from the Abbott system. And this, and uh, you can move the catheter very easily. And what you can get, we call it a, they call it a super map. Within one minute and 38 seconds, we could show the same tachycardia running in the left atrium as, if we, as we map over 20 minutes with the normal catheters. This the side where the, the tachycardia came from was here. By ablation at this, at this point, point, the tachycardia terminated, the line was closed. Is so this uh, ultrasound? Sorry? Is yes. This, 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 ultrasound? One, this one is the ultrasound, ultrasound one? Balloon? Yes, the ultrasound. Uh, catheter with the splines. This one, which I shot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And the, and, the, and the right one, the right one which you see over here is the HD catheter. Yes. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a contact mapping, this is a non-contact mapping. But the, the mechanism of ultrasound is to get the signal through? No, the ultrasound technique is, is only just to get the anatomy, but between the ultrasound traducers, there are electrodes, impedance electrodes, and th this is based on uh, d uh, charge density. It, it, it measures the, uh, the positive and negative ions on the surface, the distribution on, on that, and by an equation, uh, it's an uh, inverse algorithm, they can measure what happens at the tissue. So they measure actually the charge density and can tell you uh, where is the earliest point, where, is the, uh, uh, where, where do you have a irregularity, so that way they can uh, uh, calculate you where the electrograms are there. Who, who is the manufacturer? It's the Acutus Medical. Acutus, Acutus Medical. Yes, it's, uh, it's a little bit freaky because you're not touching the wall. It's the, 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 the advantage is that you don't have this far field problems. You don't touch the wall. You don't make any artifact uh, over there. But it's still, you're very fast yes. by doing this mapping. Yes. How is it different from the array vector? Oh, yes, it's absolutely. It is. It is somehow the way as the array catheter. Absolutely, absolutely. The engineers who, who were with the Abbots and they developed the array catheter, they are the ones who work on this catheter too. Absolutely. In the conclusion, as already said, catheter ablation is a dynamic field with rising numbers. We have a major progress in understanding the substrate and uh, how to ablate these patients. We do need these novel technologies to, to understand or to, to visualize uh, and characterize the patients, but still we remain what our success rate is still not 100%, but we're trying to, 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 to reach that one. And thank you for your attention.